Good morning. All right, that's a, that was a good, good good morning back, huh? But you brave the rain, right? Doesn't matter if it's raining, doesn't matter if it's sun shining where we're at, we're gonna praise the Lord, amen? Would you stand with us? Because he does, he's done great things, he does great things, and he's gonna do great things, amen? So no matter where we're at in the process of that, we can give him praise. Do you stand with us and give him glory? your heart to the Lord right now. Just say in your own heart, I'm going to praise you no matter where I'm at, what I'm going through, because you're worthy, God. 
I'm going to praise you with everything I have. Amen. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I praise you anywhere, praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes he is worthy of all of the praise. Sometimes you gotta praise in the prison, cry out to heaven, shout until the door swing wide. Sometimes you gotta stand on your shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere, praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest. He is worthy of all of the praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Faithful all my life, blessings day and night, countless reasons why. I'll praise you anywhere, every promise, God. goodness, every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere, faithful all my life, blessings day and night, countless reasons why. I'll praise you anywhere, every promise, God. Goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise. Give me praise, give me praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, He is worthy of all of the praise. Give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. I'll praise you anywhere. In mountain or valley, I know that you're with me there. I'll praise you anywhere. Well, good morning. You may be seated. I'm Pastor Dave. It is good to be with you. I'm the lead pastor here. And again, I find myself in the odd position of doing the morning welcome and announcement. So we'd love to welcome those of you who are tuning in online. Um, leave a comment, let us know that you're there, say hello, and then also we'd love to welcome each of you here this morning. We have a white card that is in the seat backs in front of you. If you're newer, newer with us and, and you want to get a little bit better connected, on that white card just leave your name and your email or your phone number. I don't remember which one it is. I'm not new anymore. I don't look at that. Um, there we go. And there's a QR code. Now, if you point your phone at that, 
everything that the church ever does is going to be on that QR code. So if you're like, man, I heard that there's a, a retreat coming up. I want to check that out. Scan that QR code. Man, I have wanted to uh, go to this men's event. Scan the QR code. It's all there. I want to get connected to a life group. It's all there. And, and in fact, next week, if you're new or newer with us and you just have questions about who we are as a church and what we believe, and you just want to get a little bit more interest or just a little more info about River's Edge Church, we have something called Starting Point. And we'd love it if you'd scan that QR code and let us know you're coming. So that way we could have plenty of snacks and things like that for you. But that is next week directly. I'm sorry. It's not next week. I, this is why I don't do announcements that often, right? I lead all of you astray. Trust me on the Bible, but never trust me when I talk about calendars. February 4th, in two weeks, we have something called Starting Point, and it's about helping you take your next step in faith and your next step here at REC, whether that's serving or uh, being a part of a a life group or uh, just even getting better connected here. We, we really want to help you take that next step. So check that out. Now, one of the reasons why I'm doing um, some announcements this morning, well, one, I'm not preaching, but two, I want to give you a little bit of an update about where we are with Multiply. Now, there's going to be a way bigger update coming via video really soon, but yeah, just I'm like, woohoo, video. We don't have to listen to this guy. <laughs> I feel you. I know painful listening to me talk. So I want to give you, one of the things that we did is, it's almost like setting up dominoes, right? You set up all your dominoes, so we raised a lot of money, and then we knocked off just a ton of projects, just knocked them down. So you can see we did the parking lot, that was a $25,000 project. We got that re-slurried, re-lined, all that, and, and the parking lot, that's going to continue being a problem for years, just to let you know. Uh, it's going <laughs> to, yes, amen. <laughs> oh, man. So we, we resorted that, that. That buys us a couple of years. But one of the ideas of Multiply is to take and knock off the list some big projects that have been causing us problems for years and that are super expensive. And so once we do fix these areas, we're not having to put regular budget dollars to that. And instead, we could take those budget dollars and put them towards ministry. So it's taking care of deferred maintenance. So we did the children's building roof a couple weeks ago, and that is, there's no more leaks. There's still some giant holes in the ceiling so that we were just like making sure those are going to be filled soon. Um, but down the road, we want to do a big renovation of that entire children's building because now that we've got the roof secure, we want to make sure that that building gets now uh, completely updated. And you can't really, it's like having a house, you guys. If your roof is leaky, and you're like, you know, I'm going to remodel my bathroom. You're, you're going after the wrong thing. You know, you got to fix the roof first. You got you to get that fixed. Well, on this building, well, actually, let me tell you this first. You saw that we did our logo change out and we put the new sign out in front. That looks really good. Um, and there's just a number of other things that we've done. We've changed the look inside this building. We've really modernized a lot of things that we've done with this Multiply Fund. And our board was prayerfully considering about what the next step was with some of this money. And this building that we're sitting in has five roofs, five of them. This roof on top of us being the biggest one. And um, a number of years ago, this church had solar, which did a number of, uh, it damaged our roof, essentially. Uh, we actually removed solar because of the extent of damage it did in our roof. Um, and so we, our next project is that we're doing, redoing three of the problem roofs. Um, we don't have the money to do all five. Um, in fact, the other two roofs are pretty decent. They're not that bad. So the next step is we're going to redo three of the roofs, but that wipes us out on our savings essentially with multiply. But you got to stop the leaks before you do everything else in the building. So we're doing that next. And so we just want to um, encourage you to continue prayerfully considering what you might uh, give. If Some of you have already given, and that is amazing. But some of you maybe have not given above and beyond or not considered that uh, for multiplied. So we want to encourage you to prayerfully consider, Lord, maybe what, what might you be leading me to, to possibly give towards this? We still have another year left of this campaign, and there's a number of things we want to knock off the list, including renovating these bathrooms. They're, they're just really old, and uh, there's a lot that needs to be updated there. Um, 
And you know what? There's been a lot of things that have broken too. And do you guys know, have you heard about inflation? Some of you have heard about this? Guess what? Everything is far more expensive than we originally planned. And so anyways, I just want to thank those of you who've been giving and praying for this, these projects as we continue to go, go forward. There's, again, going to be a huge video update coming forward on that. And that leads us into, uh, this is also our time of tithes and offerings, uh, a time where we give return to the Lord what the Lord has trusted us with. And uh, some of, we just want to do this as an act of worship. Uh, to the Lord. And so the way we do that here is there's a few different ways, whether it's online, that QR code, um, you could scan on your phones, or uh, in person, there's giving boxes uh, stationed at each of the doors in the back. So I want to go ahead and take a moment and pray over our offering, and I want to pray for Pastor Evan as he brings us the word this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time that we have together to study your word. Lord, we thank you for the way that you provide for this church through the offering. God, it boggles my mind sometimes how one day a week people give what you've entrusted them and it sustains us. And this church has been going for years that way. God, it confounds business models. And we just thank you that you are the God that just confounds and challenges the way the world works. So, Lord, we ask that you would take and bless and multiply our offering. Father, I ask that you would be with Pastor Evan as he teaches this morning, that you would give him a special word and that your spirit would be on him. Father, help us to hear what you have to say. Help us to discern your word for us today. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Vibe check. How's everybody feeling? You guys doing good? Doing good? Yeah, I'm not super pumped on the rain, but that's all right. Um, so far, it's been a good service. Those first couple tracks really slapped. Um, announcements, we're bussing. I, I have a feeling the sermon's going to be uh, pretty lit as well. Um, if you're really confused by all that, let me explain for a moment. Uh, <laughs> we have this ongoing joke in our staff team about Gen Z slang. Um, what it is in general, what do different particular words and phrases mean, and of course the inevitable question, wouldn't it be crazy if we use some of this stuff in a sermon? And um, POV, be careful what you wish for, because I woke up this morning and chose violence. So to my Gen Zers, you're welcome. To my fellow millennials, those in your 30s and early 40s, I know that you get it and you hate it, and I'm sorry. I had to do it for the kids. Um, for, for those of you who are uh, my Gen Xers and boomers, you older folks, if you hear some stuff that's really confusing, look around the room, find the people that are rolling their eyes or laughing at me, and ask them after the service what I'm talking about. I think it'll be good for all of us to get some uh, intergenerational uh, relationships and conversations going, which is super fitting because today we're talking about the corporate spiritual disciplines. We've been in this series called The Disciplined Life, um, looking at all the classical spiritual disciplines. There's many different uh, lists, uh, versions, categories of these out there. We've been using uh, Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline, as our guide. Um, week one, Pastor Dave introduced the spiritual disciplines, uh, a little bit what they are, what they do. Um, and essentially, a spiritual discipline is uh, any activity that you pursue in an orderly or systematic manner that results in greater depth of relationship with God. 
So there's something that you do, um, but it's also important to reiterate, which Dave said the first week, what they cannot do and what they are not. Namely, uh, the disciplines cannot earn or merit your salvation in any way. Only Jesus can do that. The disciplines simply enable you to more effectively uh, receive grace from God. Um, Sanctification, um, salvation are always a work of grace, something that we must freely um, accept by faith. The disciplines just help enable our growth and our uh, maturity. So week two, Pastor Bethany talked about the inward disciplines, uh, meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. Uh, Week three, Pastor Dave took us through the outward disciplines, uh, simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. So we did inward, we did outward, and today I'm going to talk about the corporate disciplines, which would be confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Before I get into the, the specifics, I um, just want to say up front that these are corporate disciplines. They're things we do together, but there's also a personal, individual component, of course, because it's something that you still have to do. It's something that you have to choose to personally participate in. And there's also a lot of um, overlap here. You're going to see some of the, the inward and outward disciplines come back up. Uh, different disciplines that kind of go hand in hand or one leads to the other. Um, But each corporate discipline is still its own distinctive um, practice and is still very important. So I think you'll see what I mean as we go along the way. So first, confession. Um, This one uh, seems pretty straightforward. We all know what a confession is. When someone says they have something to confess, you know what they mean. You know, they might be joking or exaggerating, but you know they're about to admit to something. Um, But in the context of a corporate spiritual discipline, uh, we have to be careful to define confession as not just admitting something, but telling the truth about hidden sin. That's your first fill-in. Confession is telling the truth about hidden sin. And the Bible is very clear that we need to confess our sins. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So confession and forgiveness go hand in hand. Uh, This is a conditional if-then statement. If we confess, then he will forgive. The reason that we need to confess our sins to God is because he doesn't want to force forgiveness upon us. He wants us to freely enter into relationship, freely choose forgiveness, and confessing sins is a big part of how we can do that. At this point already, you might be feeling a little bit of tension with this whole idea of confession as a corporate discipline. You might be thinking, yeah, I get confession, but why do I need other people? I can just confess my sins to God. This should be an inward discipline. After all, Pastor Evan, 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ. Boom, mic drop. You've been proof texted, Evan. If God forgives sins and Jesus is the only mediator between God and mankind, it seems like we don't need other people or some other mediator. We just need private confession, not corporate confession. But hold up. Let me talk to him. Because the Bible also says in James 5, 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So obviously this uh, passage is directly dealing with healing, but right before the therefore in verse 16, verse 15 ends with, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. So there's still this strong linking between sin, confession, forgiveness, but here James is talking about confessing to other believers, not God, or at least not only God. And we also have to account for uh, John 23, when Jesus tells the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. These two passages in uh, James and John, we see both sides of the corporate discipline. The giving of confession to another person and the receiving of a confession from another person. We need to confess our sins to others for forgiveness And we also have the power to forgive the confessed sins of others. But what do we do with this tension between the the private confession and the corporate confession? 
It turns out there's no real uh, contradiction. It's a both and issue. Um, we confess our sins to God and to other people. And then by implication, we can receive the confessions of others. Jesus has given us, the church, the body of believers, the authority to forgive sin. Right before Jesus tells the disciples that they have this authority, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. First, receive the Holy Spirit, and then, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. This is why uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when I go to my brother to confess, I am going to God. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we have God within us. In my mind, this is a, a logical connection. Um, it tracks the math be mathin, as they say. Salvation by grace through faith is an objective uh, reality. If it's true for me, it's true for you. I'm not that special. I'm not the main character. If you can be saved by grace through faith, so can I. So when someone comes to me, a Christian to a Christian, and confesses a sin, I can forgive them, not by my own decision, not by my determination or by my will, but by the Holy Spirit within me. It's the same spirit in them, the same spirit in me, the same spirit that Jesus gave to the disciples and gave the authority to forgive sin. It's an incredible reality that I take for granted sometimes. I think maybe many of us do, living in our hyper-individualized Western culture. But that's the reality. Jesus gave us the authority to forgive sins. And besides taking it for granted, some of us might bring a more strong and direct negative association to corporate confession. Because like many or all of the corporate disciplines, and frankly anything that involves people, it's open to abuse and manipulation. But the reality is, I didn't make this up. Uh, <laughs> Richard Foster didn't start this, and the Roman Catholic Church certainly did not invent corporate confession. It is Jesus who gave the church the authority to forgive sins of each other by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what does it look like practically? Well, a good confession needs three things. An examination of conscience, sorrow, and a determination to avoid sin. You need to see the sin for what it is. You need to deeply regret it and determine to live, think, and act differently. It's not a real confession if you're just hoping to get a quick fix of forgiveness, some cheap grace, and just go on sinning. Confessions should also be definite and specific. I have sinned. It's true. Not a great confession. I get angry sometimes. Okay, join the club. It's true, not a great confession. Last week, I got really mad and defensive when my wife asked me if I could watch the kids while she hangs out with her friends because I had other plans for my day, but then I realized she actually does a lot to take care of me and them, and if I'm really honest, I probably should have planned this for her, not have to wait to be asked. <sighs> That's a real confession. <laughs> You got to be definite. You got to be specific. You have to say what you actually did that was sinful. Thank you. I mean, some elements of that may have been true. <laughs> it's an example, guys. Okay. <laughs> and finally, with confession, you need to consider who you go to. Because all believers in Jesus can, from a theological perspective, receive a confession. It's a very important uh, implication of the priesthood of all believers. You don't need a clergy person or a pastor to receive your confession. Any believer can receive a confession and can forgive your sin. But, however, receiving confessions is not every Christian's area of strength. We know some people have a hard time keeping a secret. Um, all confessions are not for everyone. It's best one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. Um, some people are not the greatest at showing empathy, and sometimes it's just not a good fit. Maybe you need to confess an area of sin that someone else has struggled with, and it'll be a little bit hard for them to hear that. So you always need to carefully consider who you confess to, but I believe that if you consider it carefully, pray about it, God will reveal the right person to you. So the practice for this one is to find a mature believer and confess something to them. This is hard. It's probably the simplest, 
discipline to understand. You just got to go tell someone something. It's pretty simple. But it's one of the more challenging ones to actually do. To admit something that you did was wrong and that you regret takes a lot of vulnerability, a lot of humility. And my last thing I'll say on that, if it is a struggle, you sense that you need to do it, you can start by just asking for help. You can pray to God for help. Say, I need help. I need to confess this. I don't know who. I don't know how to do it, but I need help. You can find someone to confess to and tell them you need help. So I have something I want to tell you, but I don't think I can do it. And they will likely find a way to lovingly and graciously drag it out of you, and you'll both be better off for it. <laughs> All right, next, uh, worship. Worship. We know worship is honoring God with your complete devotion. Raise your hand, anybody, if you've ever been to a corporate worship service. <laughs> anybody? Oh, wow, it's worse than I thought. You guys, that's what we're all doing here right now. You should all have your hand up. A lot of shy people don't want to participate. That's okay. Normally, we call this church, but the technical term, it's a corporate worship service. The church is the people, the body of believers. What we do in church is a worship service, um, but we say church, that's fine. Um, it's very clear in the Bible, Genesis through the Ten Commandments, all the way to Revelation, which we're going to start studying next week, that there's one God. He deserves our complete, undivided devotion. And it's important that we worship God together as a community, not neglecting to meet together. John 4.23 says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. There's a couple important things in this verse that I wanted to highlight. Um, first of all, uh, true worshipers worship in spirit and truth. That's a very specific way of describing worship, but it's also very broad at the same time. And what I mean by that is that the New Testament leaves the particularities of worship very open-ended. We do things a certain way here. If you've gone to a different church service, maybe they do things a little bit differently. Um, high church, low church, slow music, fast music. Um, it's all on the table as long as it leads to worship the one true God in spirit and truth. So we shouldn't be overly attached to particular forms or rituals that we do in worship. As long as it leads you in spirit and truth to worship the one true God is revealed by Jesus, you're good. That's, that's proper worship. Um, and this verse also says, importantly, that the Father seeks such as these to worship him. This is important because God initiates worship. Worship is not something that we just decide to do on our own. God seeks us out to worship him. And so corporate worship is a dialogue. It's a, a back and forth of revelation and response. God reveals something, the congregation, the people respond, and back and forth, um, so on and so forth. Um, and the most obvious practice for the discipline of worship is to go to church. Um, and maybe for some of you, that's it. Maybe you just started coming back to church recently. Maybe I caught you this Sunday on your quarterly-ish drop in to church. Um, and keep coming to church. Uh, make it a discipline. Come every week. I think it will be good for you. Um, but for those of us who are more uh, regular attenders, I put the practice to prepare for the gathered experience of worship. Prepare for the gathered experience of worship. And this can take a lot of forms. Um, maintaining a daily personal um, attitude and spirit of worship um, can heighten your expectancy and openness to God when you do come together as a body on a Sunday morning and worship corporately. You can make this really simple and practical too. How about go to bed early on Saturday night and show up to church early? That's a great way to prepare to be here in corporate worship. And that, honestly, that one's kind of for me as much as for you guys. I think I'm going to give you a confession with, with all of these disciplines. Um, Sunday mornings can be crazy at my house. You know, my, my wife both work here full time. We've got a two-month-old and a two-year-old. It can be a little bit crazy trying to get everybody fed and dressed and out the door. Um, and I, not every week, but far too often on Saturday afternoons, find myself thinking, church tomorrow. Wish it was Friday still. <sighs> It's not a good attitude. It's not great. Um, but I have found that when I go to bed early, 
I practically prepare the house and some things beforehand, and I am not stressed on Sunday morning. I can get to church early. I'm much more receptive to what God and other people are doing in the gathered experience of worship. So prepare for the gathered experience. All right, next, guidance. I define guidance as the seeking of spirit-directed unity. What do I mean by that? It's a little bit of a peculiar definition. If you ask what guidance was um, to a random person on the street, they might just say giving advice. You say, I'm really good at guidance. I love telling people what to do. I, that's not quite what the corporate spiritual discipline is getting at of guidance. Um, it's actually the seeking of spirit-directed unity. I'm going to show you this with a couple passages in the book of Acts. So first, Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a childhood friend of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, and sent them off. Remember when I said at the start that we were going to see a lot of overlap with different disciplines all happening and leading to one another? Right here in the text, we see fasting, we see praying and worshiping, all disciplines in their own right. But I think this passage is really about guidance. God speaks to the community, and they do what he says. The Holy Spirit says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, And they do it. They lay their hands on them, and they send them off, and they go. A couple chapters later, Acts 15, the early church is dealing with uh, one of their first really contentious uh, issues surrounding how they should relate to Jewish culture. Some of the leaders want the Gentiles or the non-Jews to be required to be circumcised and follow all the Mosaic laws. But there's some disagreements about this. Um... And you can read the whole thing, but I'm just going to jump to the outcome, verse 28 and 29. The church as a unity says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Pretty straightforward to the point. Um, There's a lot to unpack in in verse 29, what those different things are and why, but I just want to focus on that very first phrase. It seemed good to us and, oh, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Um, Just like this, the previous passage in Acts 13, there's no power struggle, there's no democracy rule, they don't take a vote, they just come in unity, they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. God speaks to the people and they listen. That is a true picture of Christian guidance, the, the seeking of spirit-directed unity. So the practice for this is to ask others to listen to God on your behalf. When I think about guidance, it uh, brings to mind one particular uh, season of my life. Um, I was uh, about 25. I'm 34 right now for, for context, which seems like a long time ago. Um, I was, had moved back home with my mom, um, I, from living abroad, I was uh, racing bikes full time. I was a pro road cyclist, and I'd re-engaged and recommitted my faith. I was really uh, eager about following Jesus. Um, Sunday mornings were tough for me, so I found because I was always racing and traveling on Sundays. But I found this Monday night men's small group that was a just amazing uh, community for me um, to be a part of. And at one point in this season, I decided I'm ready to start dating. Um, but I don't have a lot of uh, natural places to meet women in my life. You know, I'm on a men's cycling team. I go to this men's small group, and so I just talking to them about how I was feeling. I want to pursue a long-term relationship, and I thought, you know what could work? Maybe I'll reach out to my high school ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and they listened to me, and they thought about it, and with spirit-directed unity, they said, how about no? (laughs) And I listened, and that was a good choice. (laughs) 
Um, and as I, in that season of time, went on to uh, meet my wife through a mutual friend in that group and uh, date her, and you know how it goes, uh, hit her with the riz, we got cuffed, um, <laughs> and we've been married for six years now, and uh, I'm just so grateful that I had that, that group and that community um, that I could go to for some um, spirit-directed unity, some guidance in my life. And the one thing I'll, I will say that's very important for guidance is that this always takes place in the context of Christian community. It's really easy to get advice and get guidance from anybody, but you need to have people who are submitted to the lordship of Christ who are going to really listen to God and come to a unified um, a picture of what God is calling you to um, in your life. And, of course, this is uh, applicable to anything. Dating, of course, um, you can seek guidance for what job you'll take, um, if you have some options, where you'll live, um, how you want to spend your time or money, um, any of the millions of decisions, seemingly, that go into parenting. Um, these are all excellent things that you should bring to community um, for guidance. You can even seek guidance for something that you're pretty sure you already know the answer to. Maybe you feel like you know what you want to do, but it's a big decision. I would encourage you to get some guidance anyways. Um, sometimes you'll have a blind spot that you need to rethink and reconsider. Other times, just the affirmation of God and the community will help persevere, will help you to persevere as you encounter hardships related to that decision later on. Sometimes you make the right choice, and just God's calling you to something challenging, and having that um, guidance up front can really help sustain you as you continue to pursue um, God's call for you. Last, but certainly not least, uh, celebration. Finding joy in the goodness of God. Um, Richard Foster says, and I agree, celebration is really, though it is its own distinct discipline, it's kind of the culmination of all the disciplines. All 11 of the disciplines we've covered so far results in joy. The faithful, regular, uh, systematic practice of these spiritual disciplines lead to joy and celebration. Even confession, which begins with sorrow, ends with the joy and celebration of forgiveness. The scripture is just permeated with this practice of celebration. I mean, if you flip open to the book of Psalms, you'll probably see someone celebrating the goodness of God. The, really, the whole Jewish calendar is just this rotation of celebrations of different times in the history that, that God has saved his people. And in the New Testament, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It's a strong, imperative command. Do it. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus. Um, this one, I'm doing pretty well at celebration right now. My family is in a, a season of celebration, partly because this is the best discipline to learn from kids. I mean, they get upset sometimes, sure, but kids can and will celebrate almost anything. Um, Sometime in the last couple of months, we told our two-year-old Zoe that she could watch a movie because it was raining outside. And so, of course, every time she wakes up in the morning or from her nap and she sees it's cloudy, she gives her cute little whisper voice, Daddy, I have an idea. Let's have a family movie day. <laughs> and, of course, if you're going to watch a movie, you've got to have good snacks, you've got to have your blankie, and it's just a celebration. I don't know if we're celebrating the rain or the movie, but in that moment, God is good, life is good, we're, we're celebrating. It's, it's a reason for joy. Um, the one uh, caution I'll give with celebration, and the reason that it is a discipline at all, is because we can't uh, treat it like some kind of blanket, uh, blind triumphalism, uh, you know, if you go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Right? It's give thanks in all circumstances, not give thanks for all circumstances. Sometimes we need to give thanks despite the circumstances. 
We have to be sure that we see the bad in the world and in ourselves as we celebrate the goodness of God. We have to resist the temptation to downplay hardships and evil things just because we know that they'll work out in the end. Just because Jesus will redeem it, has redeemed it, doesn't mean it's not evil. It doesn't mean it's not sin. This is why it's a discipline to rejoice always. It's something that we must do and pursue regularly as an act of faith, as an act of obedience to affirm the reality of evil, pain, and sorrow, yet celebrate the goodness of God. So my practice for this is just pick a date or occasion to celebrate. It doesn't have to be a huge, big thing. You can celebrate a rainy day watching movies, um, but of course it can be. You can celebrate a new job, a promotion. Um, you can celebrate finishing house projects or getting a lot of work done at home. Um, anything you can celebrate. And as we wrap up uh, this series, those are the four the corporate disciplines there. Um, I'll invite the, the band to start making their way back up. I just want to encourage you to try one of these corporate disciplines this week. Maybe something jumped out at you already as I was speaking. Uh, maybe you want to take your, your notes home and, and study those and think about it. Um, but as we've been saying all along, uh, the big danger with this teaching series and the disciplines in general is to become overwhelmed with the options and do nothing. That's the opposite of what we want to do. Disciplines are something that you must do uh, regularly and systematically. So you either can become overwhelmed with the options and do nothing or try to do it all at once, try to do too much, and you just burn out and go back to doing nothing again. So I just want to encourage you to pick one thing, something small. It's okay if it's a little scary and a little bit challenging, but still manageable, and commit to doing it, and then actually do it. Do it consistently. Do it even when you don't feel like it. It's not always going to be easy, but God is always with you, and the outcome and the culmination of any discipline is joy and freedom. And as you continue on in this new year, 2024, remember that everything you think, say, and do is forming you as a person in one way or another. Sometimes you like to think that we're just in this static state. We're just kind of coasting. We're just, we're just doing good, and we're going to make it to the next year. But that's not the reality. Everything you do is forming you in one way or another. So be intentional about being formed by God into the image of Christ. Practice the spiritual disciplines. Be intentional about who you are becoming. God loves you. God sent his son, Jesus, so that through faith in him, you can have life and have it in abundance. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your never-ending love for us. I thank you for um, just your steadfast grace and mercy. And God, for, for all those here who don't yet know you, who um, have yet to place their faith in Christ, we ask that you would just continue to draw them, that they would know the truth of the gospel, that you um, loved us so much that you sent your only son um, to die for the sins of the world, and that you want them to accept that freely by faith and come into relationship with you to receive salvation and abundant life. And God, for those of us who have made that decision and, and have been justified, we ask that you would just give us um, courage and uh, determination to engage in these disciplines, to continue growing in grace. And God, would you be with us always? Would you sustain your people? And we offer this all up to you, God, as an act of worship. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you all stand as we continue to worship? Um, as he, we were going through these disciplines, I was reading through the book right alongside. Um, I put it on my heart to pick out some of these songs that will, I, I invite you to ask the Spirit to speak to you as we go through these songs, right? First song is, is, is Come to the Altar, which is basically really a lot about confession, right? God may want us to go somewhere and confess to someone something that we have or even privacy of our heart right now. All Creatures of Our God and King, as I was thinking about the majesty of that song, I was thinking, you know, when we confess and we're restored to God, we come to this place where we're in tune with the way everything God, God made everything, right? All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, right? We can enter into that place 
when we set aside any hindrances, right? And then we can ask for his guidance within that, after that, right? So I invite you just to, if you're not going to sing, just really ask God to speak to you during this time. Amen? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? And Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? And Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
stars that sail in heaven along Oh, praise Him Hallelujah Now the rising moon in praise rejoice He lights up heaven find a
search for your Let me be to you a sacrifice And I I just want to give my appreciation to uh, Pastor Evan because I texted my daughter who's homesick, turn on YouTube right now, you have to stream this sermon, go back to the beginning. And she was texting me, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, because those Gen Z words he says. Some of you are, were completely lost, but I have a teenage daughter, I was cracking up. It's, you have to go look it up. It's insane the words that these kids are using now. I feel like the old guy up here. Uh, there's a couple of things as we leave today. There's a couple of things. One, uh, Pastor Evan said I'm starting the Revelation series next week. That's not true. It's in two weeks. But next week, I've got kind of a prelude to it. That I, There's some stuff I want to cover with you before you get into it. It'll help you understand the book better. So come next week as if we're starting it next week because I've got some stuff to cover with you. that I want to go over that. Um, and then two, before we leave... Um, I, some people texted me from the, the church this week that our neighbors next door from us, there's a boba store right next door to the grocery outlet factory. They got burglarized and vandalized, and they're on the hook for like thousands of dollars. So what I was going to tell you is just be a good neighbor. If you feel like you want a, like a, a, a treat drink this week, swing over there to the boba store and uh, patronize our neighbors. Tell them that we love them in the name of Jesus. just want to let you, encourage you to do that. Um, I don't even remember what the name is called, but it's right in the grocery outlet. Out, QT, thank you. QT Boba. No? That's not it. I don't know. It's in the grocery outlet. Whatever, that, that one. The grocery outlet. And so I want to leave us with this scripture today. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, being, may, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others as more significant than yourselves. See, as we leave today, the corporate disciplines are all about working together, leaning on one another, about doing life in Christ together. So as you leave here today, don't leave alone, but leave together. Go to community, from community to community, to worship God together in every way that you walk and move and live in life. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Father, send us now. God, we love you. We thank you. Send us into this world as a people who are after your own mission, as a people who are on fire for you, as a people who, who want to see your goodness and your kingdom come in this world. Send us as those people, oh God. Use us, God, to impact our neighborhoods for your kingdom. Use us in community to build one another up. Use us in community to see that other people go deeper with you. Use us in community, God, so, so that we could grow deeper ourselves, God, because we want to go after your own heart. Just as the song says, Lord, you have my heart, but I will search for yours. God, send us now as seekers to continue searching your own heart through community. We ask for all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great weekend.